Book Fourteen, Part Three of the Annals by Publius Cornelius Tacitus. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Andrew Coleman. The Annals by Publius Cornelius Tacitus. Translated by Alfred John Church and William Jackson Brodrib. Book 14, A.D. 59-62, to Part 3. Nero marries Poppaea, murders Octavia. That same year, two remarkable crimes were committed at Rome, one by a senator, the other by the daring of a slave. Domitius Balbus, an ex-praetor, from his prolonged old age, his childlessness, and his wealth, was exposed to many a plot. His kinsman, Valerius Fabianus, who was marked out for a career of promotion, forged a will in his name with Vinicius Rufinus and Terentius Lentinus, Roman knights, for his accomplices. These men had associated with them Antonius Primus and Asinius Marcellus, Antonius was a man of ready audacity. Marcellus had the glory of being the great-grandson of Asinius Pollio, and bore a character far from contemptible, except that he thought poverty the greatest of all evils. So Fabianus, with the persons whom I have named, and some others less distinguished, executed the will. The crime was proved against them before the Senate, and Fabianus and Antonius, with Rufinus and Terentius, were condemned under the Cornelian law. Marcellus was saved from punishment, rather than from disgrace, by the memory of his ancestors and the intercessions of the emperor. That same day was fatal also to Pompeius Aelianus, a young ex-quaestor, suspected of complicity in the villainies of Fabianus. He was outlawed from Italy, and from Spain, where he was born. Valerius Pontius suffered the same degradation for having indicted the defendants before the praetor to save them from being prosecuted in the court of the city prefect, purposing, meanwhile, to defeat justice on some legal pretext, and subsequently by collusion. A clause was added to the Senate's decree, that whoever bought or sold such a service was to be just as liable to punishment as if he had been publicly convicted of false accusation. Soon afterwards, one of his own slaves murdered the city prefect Pedanius Secundus, either because he had been refused his freedom, for which he had made a bargain, or in the jealousy of a love in which he could not brook his master's rivalry. Ancient custom required that the whole slave establishment which had dwelt under the same roof should be dragged to execution, when a sudden gathering of the populace, which was for saving so many innocent lives, brought matters to actual insurrection. Even in the Senate, there was a strong feeling on the part of those who shrank from extreme rigour, though the majority were opposed to any innovation. Of these, Caius Cassius, in giving his vote, argued to the following effect. Often have I been present, senators. In this assembly, when new decrees were demanded from us, contrary to the customs and laws of our ancestors. And I have refrained from opposition, not because I doubted, but that in all matters the arrangements of the past were better and fairer, and that all changes were for the worse, but that I might not seem to be exalting my own profession out of an excessive partiality for ancient precedent. At the same time, I thought that any influence I possess ought not to be destroyed by incessant protests, wishing that it might remain unimpaired, should the state ever need my counsels. Today this has come to pass, 
since an ex-consul has been murdered in his house by the treachery of slaves, which not one hindered or divulged, though the Senate's decree, which threatens the entire slave establishment with execution, has been till now unshaken. Vote impunity in heaven's name, and then who will be protected by his rank, when the prefecture of the capital has been of no avail to its holder? Who will be kept safe by the number of his slaves, when four hundred have not protected Pedanius Secundus? Which of us will be rescued by his domestics, who, even with the dread of punishment before them, regard not our dangers? Was the murderer, as some do not blush to pretend, avenging his wrongs, because he had bargained about money from his father, or because a family slave was taken from him? Let us actually decide that the master was justly slain. Is it your pleasure to search for arguments in a matter already weighed in the deliberations of wiser men than ourselves? Even if we had now, for the first time, to come to a decision, do you believe that a slave took courage to murder his master without letting fall a threatening word or uttering a rash syllable? Granted that he concealed his purpose, that he procured his weapon without his fellow's knowledge. Could he pass the night guard? Could he open the doors of the chamber, carry in a light and accomplish the murder while all were in ignorance? There are many preliminaries to guilt. If these are divulged by slaves, we may live singly amid numbers, safe among a trembling throng. Lastly, if we must perish, it will be with vengeance on the guilty. Our ancestors always suspected the temper of their slaves. Even when they were born on the same estates, or in the same houses with themselves, and thus inherited from their birth an affection for their masters, but now that we have in our households nations with different customs to our own, with a foreign worship or none at all, it is only by terror you can hold in such a motley rabble. But, it will be said, the innocent will perish. Well, even in a beaten army, when every tenth man is felled by the club, the lot falls also on the brave. There is some injustice in every great precedent, which, though injurious to individuals, has its compensation in the public advantage. No one, indeed, dared singly to oppose the opinion of Cassius. But clamorous voices rose in reply from all who pitied the number, age, or sex, as well as the undoubted innocence of the great majority. Still, the party which voted for their execution prevailed. But the sentence could not be obeyed in the face of a dense and threatening mob, with stones and firebrands. Then the emperor reprimanded the people by edict, and lined with a force of soldiers the entire route by which the condemned had to be dragged to execution. Kingonius Varro had proposed that even all the freedmen under the same roof should be transported from Italy. This the emperor forbade, as he did not wish an ancient custom which mercy had not relaxed to be strained with cruel rigour. During the same consulship, Tarquitius Priscus was convicted of extortion on the prosecution of the Bithynians, to the great joy of the senators, 
who remembered that he had impeached Statilius, his own proconsul. An assessment was made of Gaul by Quintus Velusius, Sextius Africanus, and Trebellius Maximus. There was a rivalry, on the score of rank, between Velusius and Africanus. While they both disdained Trebellius, they raised him above themselves. In that year died Memmius Regulus, who from his solid worth and consistency was as distinguished as it is possible to be under the shadow of an emperor's grandeur. So much so, in fact, that Nero, when he was ill, with flatterers round him, who said that if aught befell him in the course of destiny, there must be an end of the empire, replied that the state had a resource, and on their asking where it was specially to be found, he added, in Memmius Regulus. Yet Regulus lived after this, protected by his retiring habits, and by the fact that he was a man of newly risen family, and of wealth which did not provoke envy. Nero, the same year, established a gymnasium, where oil was furnished to knights and senators, after the lax fashion of the Greeks. In the consulship of Publius Marius and Lucius Asinius, Antistius, the praetor, whose lawless behaviour as tribune of the people I have mentioned, composed some libellous verses on the emperor, which he openly recited at a large gathering, when he was dining at the house of Astorius Scapula. He was upon this impeached of high treason by Cossutianus Capito, who had lately been restored to a senator's rank on the intercession of his father-in-law, Tigellinus. This was the first occasion on which the law of treason was revived, and men thought that it was not so much the ruin of Antistius which was aimed at, as the glory of the emperor, whose veto as tribune might save from death one whom the senate had condemned. Though Astorius had stated that he had heard nothing as evidence, the adverse witnesses were believed, and Junius Marullus, consul-elect, proposed that the accused should be deprived of his praetorship and be put to death in the ancient manner. The rest assented, and then Paetus Thrasia, after much eulogy of Caesar, and most bitter censure of Antistius, argued that it was not what a guilty prisoner might deserve to suffer, which ought to be decreed against him under so excellent a prince, and by a senate bound by no compulsion. The executioner and the halter, he said, we have long ago abolished. Still, there are punishments ordained by the laws, which prescribe penalties, without judicial cruelty and disgrace to our age. Rather send him to some island, after confiscating his property. There, the longer he drags on his guilty life, the more wretched will he be personally, and the more conspicuous as an example of public clemency. Thrasia's free-spokenness broke through the civility of the other senators. As soon as the consul allowed a division, they voted with him, with but few exceptions. Among these, the most enthusiastic in his flattery was Aulus Vitellius, who attacked all the best men with abuse, and was silent when they replied, the usual way of a cowardly temper. The consuls, however, did not dare to ratify the Senate's vote, and simply communicated their unanimous resolution to the emperor. Hesitating for a while, between shame and rage, he at last wrote to them in reply, that Antistius, without having been provoked by any wrong, had uttered outrageous insults against the sovereign that a demand for punishment had been submitted to the Senate, and that it was right that a penalty should be decreed proportioned to the offence, that for himself, inasmuch as he would have opposed severity in the sentence, 
he would not be an obstacle to leniency. They might determine as they pleased, and they had free liberty to acquit. This, and more to the same effect, having been read out, clearly showing his displeasure, the consuls did not for that reason alter the terms of the motion, nor did Thrasia withdraw his proposal, or the Senate reject what it had once approved. Some were afraid of seeming to expose the emperor to odium. The majority felt safe in numbers, while Thrasia was supported by his usual firmness of spirit, and a determination not to let his fame perish. A similar accusation caused the downfall of Fabricius Veiento. He had composed many libels on senators and pontiffs in a work to which he gave the title of Codicils. Talius Geminus, the prosecutor, further stated that he had habitually trafficked in the emperor's favours and in the right of promotion. This was Nero's reason for himself undertaking the trial, and having convicted Veiento, he banished him from Italy, and ordered the burning of his books, which, while it was dangerous to procure them, were anxiously sought and much read. Soon, full freedom for their possession caused their oblivion. But while the miseries of the state were daily growing worse, its supports were becoming weaker. Burrus died, whether from illness or from poison was a question. It was supposed to be illness, from the fact that from the gradual swelling of his throat inwardly, and the closing up of the passage, he ceased to breathe. Many positively asserted that by Nero's order his throat was smeared with some poisonous drug, under the pretense of the application of a remedy, and that Burrus, who saw through the crime, when the emperor paid him a visit, recoiled with horror from his gaze, and merely replied to his question, I indeed am well. Rome felt for him a deep and lasting regret, because of the remembrance of his worth, because too of the merely passive virtue of one of his successors, and the very flagrant iniquities of the other. For the emperor had appointed two men to the command of the praetorian cohorts, Phineas Rufus, for a vulgar popularity, which he owed to his administration of the corn supplies without profit to himself, and Sophonius Tigellinus, whose inveterate shamelessness and infamy were an attraction to him. As might have been expected from their known characters, Tigellinus had the greater influence with the prince, and was the associate of his most secret profligacy, while Rufus enjoyed the favour of the people and of the soldiers, and this, he found, prejudiced him with Nero. The death of Burrus was a blow to Seneca's power, for virtue had not the same strength when one of its companions, so to say, was removed, and Nero too began to lean on worse advisers. They assailed Seneca with various charges, representing that he continued to increase a wealth which was already so vast as to be beyond the scale of a subject, and was drawing to himself the attachment of the citizens, while in the picturesqueness of his gardens, and the magnificence of his country houses, he almost surpassed the emperor. They further alleged against him that he claimed for himself alone the honours of eloquence, and composed poetry more assiduously as soon as a passion for it had seized on Nero. Openly inimical to the prince's amusements, he disparaged his ability in driving horses, and ridiculed his voice whenever he sang. When was there to be an end of nothing being publicly admired, but what Seneca was thought to have originated? Surely Nero's boyhood was over, 
and he was all but in the prime of youthful manhood. He ought to shake off a tutor, furnished as he was, with sufficiently noble instructors in his own ancestors. Seneca, meanwhile, aware of these slanders, which were revealed to him by those who had some respect for merit, coupled with the fact that the emperor more and more shunned his intimacy, besought the opportunity of an interview. This was granted, and he spoke as follows. It is fourteen years ago, Caesar, that I was first associated with your prospects, and eight years since you have been emperor. In the interval you have heaped on me such honours and riches that nothing is wanting to my happiness but a right use of it. I will refer to great examples, taken not from my own, but from your position. Your great-grandfather, Augustus, granted to Marcus Agrippa the calm repose of Mytilene, to Caius Mycenus what was nearly equivalent to a foreign retreat in the capital itself. One of these men shared his wars, the other struggled with many laborious duties at Rome. Both received awards, which were indeed splendid, but only proportioned to their great merits. For myself, what other recompense had I for your munificence than a culture nursed, so to speak, in the shade of retirement, and to which a glory attaches itself, because I thus seem to have helped on the early training of your youth, an ample reward for the service. You, on the other hand, have surrounded me with vast influence and boundless wealth, so that I often think within myself, am I, who am but of an equestrian and provincial family, numbered among the chief men of Rome, among nobles who can show a long succession of glories, has my new name become famous? Where is the mind once content with a humble lot? Is this the man who is building up his garden terraces, who paces grandly through these suburban parks and revels in the affluence of such broad lands and such widely spread investments? Only one apology occurs to me, that it would not have been right in me to have thwarted your bounty. And yet we have both filled up our respective measures, you in giving as much as a prince can bestow on a friend, and I in receiving as much as a friend can receive from a prince. All else only fosters envy, which, like all things human, sinks powerless beneath your greatness, though on me it weighs heavily. To me relief is a necessity, just as I should implore support if exhausted by warfare or travel. So in this journey of life, old as I am, and unequal even to the lightest cares, since I cannot any longer bear the burden of my wealth, I crave assistance. Order my property to be managed by your agents, and be included in your estate. Still I shall not sink myself into poverty, but having surrendered the splendours which dazzle me, I will henceforth again devote to my mind all the leisure and attention now reserved for my gardens and country houses. You have yet before you a vigorous prime, and that on which for so many years your eyes were fixed, supreme power. We, your older friends, can answer for our quiet behaviour. It will likewise redound to your honour that you have raised to the highest places men who could also bear moderate fortune. Nero's reply was substantially this. 
my being able to meet your elaborate speech with an instant rejoinder is, I consider, primarily your gift, for you taught me how to express myself, not only after reflection, but at a moment's notice. My great-grandfather, Augustus, allowed Agrippa and Mycenas to enjoy rest after their labours, but he did it at an age carrying with it an authority sufficient to justify any boon, of any sort he might have bestowed, but neither of them did he strip of the rewards he had given. It was by war and its perils they had earned them, for in these the youth of Augustus was spent, and if I had passed my years in arms, your sword and right hand would not have failed me. But, as my actual condition required, you watched over my boyhood, then over my youth, with wisdom, counsel, and advice and indeed your gifts to me will, as long as life holds out, be lasting possessions, those which you owe to me, your parks, investments, your country houses, are liable to accidents. Though they seem much, many far inferior to you in merit have obtained more. I am ashamed to quote the names of freedmen who parade a greater wealth, Hence I actually blush to think that, standing as you do first in my affections, you do not as yet surpass all in fortune. Yours, too, is a still vigorous manhood, quite equal to the labours of business, and to the fruit of those labours, and, as for myself, I am but treading the threshold of empire but perhaps you count yourself inferior to Vitellius, thrice a consul, and me to Claudius. Such wealth as long thrift has procured for Volusius, my bounty, you think, cannot fully make up to you. Why not rather, if the frailty of my youth goes in any respect astray, call me back and guide yet more zealously with your help the manhood which you have instructed? It will not be your moderation, if you restore me your wealth, not your love of quiet, if you forsake your emperor, but my avarice, the fear of my cruelty, which will be in all men's mouths. Even if your self-control were praised to the utmost, still it would not be seemly in a wise man to get glory for himself in the very act of bringing disgrace on his friend. To these words the emperor added embraces and kisses, for he was formed by nature and trained by habit to veil his hatred under delusive flattery. Seneca thanked him, the usual end of an interview with a despot, but he entirely altered the practices of his former greatness. He kept the crowds of his visitors at a distance, avoided trains of followers, seldom appeared in Rome, as though weak health or philosophical studies detained him at home. When Seneca had fallen, it was easy to shake the position of Phineas Rufus by making Agrippina's friendship a charge against him. Tigellinus, who was daily becoming more powerful, and who thought that the wicked schemings which alone gave him strength would be better liked if he could secure the emperor's complicity in guilt, dived into Nero's most secret apprehensions, and, as soon as he had ascertained that Plautus and Sulla were the men he most dreaded, Plautus having been lately sent away to Asia, Sulla to Gallia Narbonensis, he spoke much of their noble rank, and of their respective proximity to the armies of the East and of Germany. I have no eye, he said, like Boris, to two conflicting aims, but only to Nero's safety, which is at least secured against treachery in Rome by my presence. As for distant commotions, how can they be checked? Gaul is roused at the name of the great dictator, and I distrust no less the nations of Asia, 
because of the renown of such a grandfather as Drusus. Sulla is poor, and hence comes his surpassing audacity. He shams apathy while he is seeking an opening for his reckless ambition. Plautus again, with his great wealth, does not so much as affect a love of repose, but he flaunts before us his imitations of the old Romans, and assumes the self-consciousness of the Stoics, along with a philosophy which makes men restless and eager for a busy life. There was not a moment's delay. Sulla, six days afterwards, was murdered by assassins brought over to Massilia, while he was reclining at the dinner-table, before he feared or heard of his danger. The head was taken to Rome, and Nero scoffed at its premature grey hairs, as if they were a disfigurement. It was less of a secret that there was a design to murder Plautus, as his life was dear to many. The distance, too, by land and sea, and the interval of time, had given rise to rumours, and the popular story was that he had tampered with Corbulo, who was then at the head of great armies, and would be a special mark for danger, if illustrious and innocent men were to be destroyed. Again Asia, it was said, from its partiality for the young man, had taken up arms, and the soldiers sent to do the crime, not being sufficient in number, or decided in purpose, and finding themselves unable to execute their orders, had gone over to the new cause. These absurdities, like all popular gossip, gathered strength from the idle leisure of a credulous society. As it was, one of Plautus's freedmen, thanks to swift winds, arrived before the centurion, and brought him a message from his father-in-law, Lucius Antistius. He was to avoid the obvious refuge of a coward's death, and in the pity felt for a noble name he would soon find good men to help him, and daring spirits would rally round him. Meantime, no resource was to be rejected. If he did but repel sixty soldiers, this was the number on the way, while tidings were being carried back to Nero, while another force was on its march. Many events would follow, which would ripen into war. Finally, by this plan, he either secured safety, or he would suffer nothing worse, by daring, than by cowardice. But all this had no effect on Plautus. Either he saw no resource before him, an unarmed exile as he was, or he was weary of an uncertain hope, or was swayed by his love of his wife and of his children, to whom he thought the emperor, if harassed by no anxiety, would be more merciful. Some say that another message came to him from his father-in-law, representing that no dreadful peril hung over him, and that two teachers of philosophy, Coeranus from Greece, and Musonius from Etruria, advised him to await death with firmness, rather than lead a precarious and anxious life. At all events, he was surprised at midday, when stripped for exercise. In that state the centurion slew him, in the presence of Pelago, an eunuch, whom Nero had set over the centurion and his company, like a despot's minister over his satellites. The head of the murdered man was brought to Rome. At its sight, the emperor exclaimed, I give his very words, Why would you have been a Nero? Then, casting off all fear, he prepared to hurry on his marriage with Poppaea, hitherto deferred because of such alarms as I have described, and to divorce his wife Octavia, notwithstanding her virtuous life, because her father's name and the people's affection for her made her an offence to him. He wrote, however, a letter to the Senate, confessing nothing about the murders of Sulla and Plautus, but merely hinting that both had a restless temper, 
and that he gave the most anxious thought to the safety of the state. On this pretext a thanksgiving was decreed, and also the expulsion from the senate of Sulla and Plautus, more grievous, however, as a farce than as an actual calamity. Nero, on receiving this decree of the Senate, and seeing that every piece of his wickedness was regarded as a conspicuous merit, drove Octavia from him, alleging that she was barren, and then married Poppaea. The woman who had long been Nero's mistress, and ruled him first as a paramour, then as her husband, instigated one of Octavia's servants to accuse her an intrigue with a slave. The man fixed on as the guilty lover was one by name Eucherus, an Alexandrine by birth, skilled in singing to the flute. As a consequence, her slave girls were examined under torture, and though some were forced by the intensity of agony into admitting falsehoods, most of them persisted in upholding the virtue of their mistress. One of them said, in answer to the furious menaces of Tigellinus, that Octavia's person was purer than his mouth. Octavia, however, was dismissed under the form of an ordinary divorce, and received possession of the house of Burrus, and of the estates of Plautus, an ill-starred gift. She was soon afterwards banished to Campania under military surveillance, this led to incessant and outspoken remonstrances among the common people, who have less discretion, and are exposed to fewer dangers than others, from the insignificance of their position. Upon this Nero, though he did not repent of his outrage, restored to Octavia her position as wife. Then people in their joy went up to the Capitol, and at last gave thanks to the gods. They threw down the statues of Poppaea, they bore on their shoulders the images of Octavia, covering them with flowers, and setting them up in the forum and in the temples. There was even a burst of applause for the emperor, men hailing the recalled Octavia. And now they were pouring into the palace in crowds, with loud shoutings, when some companies of soldiers rushed out and dispersed the tumultuous throng with blows and at the point of the sword. Whatever changes had been made in the riot were reversed and Poppaea's honours restored. Ever relentless in her hatred, she was now enraged by the fear that either the violence of the mob would burst on her with yet fiercer fury or that Nero would be swayed by the popular bias. And so, flinging herself at his knees, she exclaimed that she was not in the position of a rival fighting for marriage, though that was dearer to her than life, but that her very life was brought into jeopardy by the dependents and slaves of Octavia, who had assumed the name of the people, and dared in peace what could hardly happen in war. Those arms, she said, have been taken up against the emperor. A leader only is wanting, and he will easily be found in a commotion. Only let her whose mere beck, though she is far away, stirs up tumult, quit Campania, and make her way in person to Rome. And again, what is my sin? What offence have I caused any one? Is it that I am about to give to the house of the Caesars a lawful heir? Do the people of Rome prefer that the offspring of an Egyptian flute-player should be raised to the imperial throne? In a word, if it be expedient, Nero should of his own choice, rather than on compulsion, send for her who ruled him, or else secure his safety by a righteous vengeance. The beginning of a commotion has often been quieted by slight precautions. But if people once despair of Octavia being Nero's wife, 
they will soon find her a husband. Her various arguments, tending both to frighten and to enrage, at once alarmed and incensed her listener. But the suspicion about the slave was of little weight, and the torture of the slave girls exposed its absurdity. Consequently, it was decided to procure a confession from someone on whom could also be fastened a charge of revolutionary designs. Fittest for this seemed the perpetrator of the mother's murder, Anikitus, commander, as I have already mentioned, of the fleet at Mycenaeum, who got but scant gratitude after that atrocious deed, and subsequently all the more vehement hatred, inasmuch as men look on their instruments in crime as a sort of standing reproach to them. The emperor accordingly sent for Anikitus, and reminded him of his former service. He alone, he said, had come to the rescue of the prince's life against a plotting mother. Close at hand was a chance of winning no less gratitude by ridding him of a malignant wife. No violence or weapons were needed. Only let him confess to an intrigue with Octavia. Nero then promised him a secret but ample immediate recompense, and some delightful retreat, while he threatened him with death in case of refusal. Anikitus, with the moral insensibility of his nature, and a promptness inspired by previous atrocities, invented even more than was required of him, and confessed before friends whom the prince had called in, as a sort of judicial counsel. He was then banished to Sardinia, where he endured exile without poverty, and died a natural death. Nero, meanwhile, declared by edict that the prefect had been corrupted into a design of gaining over the fleet, and added, in forgetfulness of his late charge of barrenness against Octavia, that, conscious of her profligacies, she had procured abortion, a fact he had himself ascertained. Then he confined her in the island of Pandateria. No exile ever filled the eyes of beholders with tears of greater compassion. Some still remembered Agrippina, banished by Tiberius, and the yet fresher memory of Julia, whom Claudius exiled, was present to men's thoughts. But they had life's prime for their stay. They had seen some happiness, and the horror of the moment was alleviated by recollections of a better lot in the past. For Octavia, from the first, her marriage day was a kind of funeral. Brought as she was, into a house where she had nothing but scenes of mourning. Her father, and an instant afterwards, her brother, having been snatched from her by poison. Then a slave girl raised above the mistress. Poppia married only to ensure a wife's ruin, and, to end all, an accusation more horrible than any death. And now the girl, in her twentieth year, with centurions and soldiers around her, already removed from among the living by the forecast of doom, still could not reconcile herself to death. After an interval of a few days, she received an order that she was to die, although she protested that she was now a widow and only a sister, and appealed to their common ancestors the Germanici, and finally to the name of Agrippina, during whose life she had endured a marriage which was miserable enough indeed, but not fatal. She was then tightly bound with cords, and the veins of every limb were opened. But as her blood was congealed by terror, and flowed too slowly, she was killed outright by the steam of an intensely hot bath. To this was added the yet more appalling horror of Poppea beholding the severed head 
which was conveyed to Rome. And for all this, offerings were voted to the temples. I record the fact with a special object. Whoever would study the calamities of that period in my pages, or those of other authors, is to take it for granted that as often as the emperor directed banishments or executions, so often was there a thanksgiving to the gods. And what formerly commemorated some prosperous event was then a token of public disaster. Still, if any decree of the Senate was marked by some new flattery, or by the lowest servility, I shall not pass it over in silence. That same year Nero was believed to have destroyed by poison two of his most powerful freedmen, Doriphorus, on the pretext of his having opposed the marriage with Poppaea, Pallas, for still keeping his boundless wealth by a prolonged old age. Romanus had accused Seneca in stealthy calumnies of having been an accomplice of Caius Piso, but he was himself crushed more effectually by Seneca on the same charge. This alarmed Piso, and gave rise to a huge fabric of unsuccessful conspiracies against Nero. End of Book 14 Recording by Andrew Coleman